I'll talk about primarily the um, rise of industrialization, uh, which starts mostly in Europe first. Uh, I'll kind of talk about how it kind of spreads throughout the world, like the United States and other countries. I'll also talk about the rise of socialism, which kind of starts in the mid to late 19th century, doesn't really take off till later in the 20th century, like say communism, they have, they have later, uh, but it's a topic we'll kind of talk about and I'll probably share with you a little short video uh, today uh, on Karl Marx, you know, the father of Marxism, who, of course, heavily influenced uh, socialism. Uh, so if you have a comment, question about this lecture, uh, either live stream or later, uh, you can always leave me a comment on my channel. Uh, you can also subscribe to my channel uh, as well. Uh, also, uh, my students out there, uh, I think most of you know by email, but if you have a administrative question about the class, uh, please let me know uh, anytime. So uh, anyway, like I said, we're going to, of course, move on to talk about uh, the Industrial Revolution. Uh, the Industrial Revolution was something that started not really in the 19th century. It actually kind of went back before that uh, to the, uh, really to the 18th century, in the 1700s uh, is when it really got started. Uh, primarily, it started in uh, Britain. Like Britain is like, you know, England and Scotland. Those were the main areas that first really uh, industrialized. And then it spread into parts of Western Europe, like France, uh, Germany, uh, et cetera, were some of, kind of the first to kind of industrialize and then spreading all the way into uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, and then to the rest of the world, I know by the pretty much the 19th century, uh, the United States started to really industrialize uh, Asia later, too. I think Japan uh, and some other Asian powers were some of the first to really industrialize. And the British going into India, of course, helped to uh, industrialize those areas uh, also uh, as well. Uh, there's a lot of things that influenced industrialization. Uh, but uh, in the end, what happened was uh, a lot of economies, like with states in general, not just in Europe, but worldwide, they began to transition to using like machines, uh, inventions and things like that uh, to, to uh, you know, speed up the process of making, you know, products in the economy, et cetera. Chemical iron production, you can see there also were other influences. Uh, the use of steam power came first, I think was one of the big things, like the so-called Watt engine, which would be influential from James Watt. Uh, water, electrical power uh, also as well use of machine tools, and the development of factories and other industries were kind of instrumental in really getting the Industrial Revolution uh, going. Uh, and there's a lot of innovations that really went into uh, the Industrial Revolution. Uh, these are kind of a list of them, I know, uh, but <laughs> those are all the things that really happened uh, in the Industrial Revolution. They went to from iron to making steel. Steel making you know, processes were kind of developed uh, at that time, mass production. You start to see assembly lines by the 20th century, I know, uh, everywhere. Electrical grid systems, uh, you know, because of Westinghouse, you know, George Westinghouse, uh, large scale manufacturing machine tools, advanced machinery, and all kinds of new inventions that really advanced uh, the Industrial Revolution pretty much uh, overall. So, yeah, um, usually the Industrial Revolution is divided into two phases. They, they've got the so-called First Industrial Revolution, which started in really Great Britain. England, Scotland, like London, Birmingham, cities like that uh, were really the first to uh, become industrialized uh, type cities uh, in the world. And then the United States and other countries like in modern Europe and so on, Western Europe, et cetera, they also began to industrialized sometime in the mid 19th century up to like World War I. They usually put it like in two phases, of course, uh, the Industrial Revolution. Now I'll get into today and I'll kind of talk about some of the causes that really led to uh, industrialization uh, in general. Uh, they have uh, something that happens in uh, Britain that's kind of important. They have this thing that's called the British Agricultural Revolution. Uh, that started in the uh, 18th century and continued into the 1800s. Uh, and it's a major factor on why 
uh, Britain industrialized. Uh, you can see there one of the big things they had that really led to the British Agricultural Revolution was the so-called enclosure movement uh, that happened. And uh, Britain went, went away from the open field system where uh, in medieval times uh, they had the manorial system where uh, it was a system of the manners of the upper class nobility. Uh, but they started to go away from that kind of thing and all the all the land became enclosed into larger uh, larger farms, uh, and uh, because of this, they had to basically create more efficient farms uh, to actually you know work and produce enough crops to feed the whole population uh, in general. And so, what happened was it eventually led to better types of uh, farming practices that became more modernized, and I think that was definitely a major cause of why you know, the, the Industrial Revolution happened. So a lot of this cut a lot of labor uh, costs. It also costs basically less money. A uh, farmer, farmer costs, you know, the farm, the farm was cut in half or less uh, at that time. Uh, and so um, because this more efficient type farming, more mechanical type farming, of course, uh, you get this case where there's a lot of workers uh, that are just a surplus. Uh, where there's not enough to really work out in the countryside of uh, farming. And so um, a lot of them leave to go to the cities, uh, which are becoming industrialized, and that's where all their, their labor comes from, of course. It was also because of uh, the grazing of sheep and other cattle that, that also led to it uh, as well. I'll talk about some examples of, of scientific farming, but, you know, scientific farming, you have new techniques they start to use. I'll get to Jethro Tull uh, in a second, but mechanic, mechanized equipment, you know, starts coming along. Uh, by the, you know, you get into the 18th, 19th century, you start seeing that, of course, use of fertilizers, chemicals uh, to grow crops, selective breeding of, of cattle, uh, new crop rotation systems also come in uh, as well. Though, so these are all kinds of influences that were really big. Uh, Jethro Tull, who you see there, uh, was a famous British agriculturalist uh, around the turn of the 18th century. And he was one of the first to develop like what they call a seed drill uh, to, to actually grow crops um, and, grow, and basically plant, plant seed mechanical, mechanical wise. Uh, and so he was considered one of the first to really industrialize farming. And uh, and so they think he's the actual first that really started the whole British agricultural revolution. So some of the things that he started doing, I think he even developed like a mechanical hub, like to help to till the soil uh, and things like that. And I think he was the first to actually get the um, farmers to start using like manure more and things like that, that like fertilizers to, you know, grow crops uh, in general. Uh, of course, uh, here's another picture of, of course, of Jethro Toll uh, with his uh, seed drill, of course, on the right that you're looking at. Uh, some people confuse him with a rock band you may have heard of named Jethro Toll, <laughs> which is where the name came from uh, and all that. You know, have you ever seen that the music with the flute in it and all that? They had a song called um, "A Locom Locomotive Breath" and "Aqua Lung" and all those songs. I think that exist. That's where the name came from. You know, all that. But um, I did want to talk about the fact that they did develop new crop rotation systems uh, also as well. Uh, and uh, the most famous was the Norfolk Four Course System. Uh, where uh, they basically rotated crops using these fodder crops or nitrogen-rich type plants uh, that could help to uh, replenish the soil. And turnips were first suggested by this man named uh, Charles Townsend, who you see on the bottom right there. Uh, they sometimes call him uh, uh, Turnip Townsend because he was kind of obsessed with this idea of, of trying to, you know, uh, get people to... Um, grow crops this way. Not just that, but other kinds of crops like, you know, clover and other other kinds of fodder crops they use as well. But you can see how, how it worked uh, in this uh, circle right there. But in the middle there, you can see how wheat and barley were the two main crops, as an example, you might grow. And then as your fodder crops, you would use like turnips uh, or maybe 
clover or, or some kind of rye grass, basically. And this would help to replenish the soil, basically, uh, when you grow crops. And you would just rotate that every year. So where it says barley right there, the next year they might grow turnips instead. Uh, so kind of rotate it every year. So that's something you see a lot today, crop rotations. They kind of still do this uh, more or less uh, worldwide. So there's, there's Turnip Townsend, as he was called. He also got them to use like manure and things like that. So you start to see alfalfa. That's another type of uh, fodder crop. They use all kinds of different fodder crops that are out there, of course, that are used, of course, today. Uh, mechanically, you got things like John Deere. You probably heard of him. John Deere was a famous American farm equipment ma manufacturer uh, in the 1800s. He was one of the first to mass produce like plows, like you're looking at, which I guess were first iron. And then by the end of the 19th century, they started to use like steel, a lot stronger iron uh, being used. So he's important. And then later on, they start developing cultivators, combines, tractors, uh, things like that. Uh, are also used uh, also. You may have heard of Cyrus McCormick. Uh, he's also well known. Uh, he had a company called International Harvester, uh, which was up in, I think, Illinois, uh, Ch Chicago, I believe it is. Uh, and uh, they were one of the first to mass produce, like first, the first uh, mechanical reapers, like to, like to, you know, harvest grain and things like that. Uh, so you start seeing mechanical type reapers and other things like that to harvest things and also separate the grain from the crop and all of that. And of course, tractors and things like that. Like I know the uh, International Harvester had the red tractors and uh, John Deere had the green tractors. <laughs> kind of like competition there and all that. Uh, Robert Bakewell uh, in Britain, by the way, uh, was one of the first to develop like selective breeding uh, right around the 1760s where they could you know, produce the best type of animal uh, by, you know, mating this bull or this sheep with this, you know, other animal and get better, better animals. And so with that, they were able to eventually, you know, produce more cattle and, and things like that. And so that that's all kind of very important too, uh, as well. I know sheep was a big thing, but uh, England, other areas in Britain uh, to produce for the wool, uh, for cloth. Now I'm going to get into and talk about uh, the inventions of the Industrial Revolution. One area I'm going to talk about first that was really big uh, was the textile industry, uh, which really took off in the 1700s, 1800s. All this was because of a population boom uh, that started. Like a lot of your cities, especially in Europe, started to get much larger. Uh, example, uh, London uh, in 1800 uh, had a population of 1 million people. Seems like a lot, doesn't it? Well, in 1850, it went to 2.3 million. And then by 1900, you know, before World War I, it was over 6 million. So all these cities start booming and getting larger and larger. You see this in Europe and also in North America, also other, other cities throughout the world uh, as well. So they need to produce more cloth, you know, to keep up with the demand uh, of people. Uh, and uh, so that, that spawned industries like, you know, the, the textile industry was one of the earliest ones that really got started that used a lot of new inventions. So you see it's like wool, you know, cotton, you know, the flax plant to make linen and so on. So those are all early industries that were real big. Uh, besides that, besides those kind of industries, they had other industries like such as um, pretty much the iron and steel industry uh, becomes big in the 19th century building locomotives, building ships, uh, things like that uh, as well. Uh, and um, oil oil patrolling in industry was also big later uh, overall. So you got all kinds of different industries that kind of start, start sprouting up, of course, uh, everywhere. Now I'm going to get into, of course, uh, and talk about uh, some different inventions that were big uh, in the... Um, textile industry. One of the first is the flying shuttle. They consider that to be one of the first major inventions of the textile industry. Uh, developed in 1733 by uh, this uh, Englishman named John Kay. Uh, and uh, it was considered one of the first major inventions uh, that really influenced the uh, industry, 
developing cloth overall. Also, um, was a type of invention that really cut cut time in half, cut labor in half. Uh, in uh, they start using these machines uh, in um, like factories, uh, like textile mills, uh, things like that. And a lot of these early machines were kind of controversial because uh, it put a lot of workers out of business, especially women that worked in the home that use like spinning wheels or whatever. Uh, this one, you only use like one person to really do it, to run the whole thing. Uh, another invention was the spinning jenny, which they talked about in a little short video uh, at the beginning. The spinning jenny was famous for being one of the first uh, multi-spindle weaving frame that used like a spinning wheel. They think that was the one that really revolutionized the uh, textile industry more than anything. Uh, so it's considered like the first major textile loom of course, it has a spinning wheel. Uh, it was hand cranked at first, but you know later machines they have later are probably mechanical. But most of these are still kind of around the day. Uh, they're still kind of used variations of spinning jenny uh, in the modern world, believe it or not. Uh, and uh, and then they had the, uh, the the most famous one that they really developed uh, in the 18th century was the textile uh, loom, which is the water frame. Uh, this one was. Uh, an invention that really they started using in the 1770s. And it was invented by this man you see below uh, named Richard Arkwright. Arkwright was the father of the textile industry. Uh, and uh, he built the first textile mill uh, in, in England, which he started in the 1770s. And uh, there was actually this um, textile uh, mill that he built. I do have a picture of, which is right here. It was called Derwent Valley Mills in Derbyshire, England. That was considered one of the first textile mills ever built uh, in the world. It was, I guess, used for a long time. Uh, and so from there, uh, you know, a lot of cities in England, you know, and other places throughout the world start building these textile mills to, you know, produce more cloth uh, throughout the world. So it was first of many of these textile factories uh, that you'll have. Uh, overall, the work there was pretty hard. You know, uh, obviously, you can get your hand caught in some of these machines. Uh, and um, a lot of these um, uh, inventions were used like in the factories with what they call a water wheel. Uh, a lot of them were early, early on were water powered uh, in general. And so um, that's something you see right there on the left and right, I guess. Uh, by, by these, the, the idea of the water wheel was, was not something new. Uh, it went back to ancient times and medieval times. Uh, it's, that's something you start to see before, you know, before they have electricity and things like that. But some old mills, you still see that today. So they use it to grind grain or whatever uh, that they have. But it's obviously something rare today. Also with the sawmills, uh, like they cut wood, things like that as well. Uh, they did have some machines later, like this one, uh, the so-called spinning mule, uh, which was developed by Samuel Crompton in the, in the late 18th century. That one was uh, a very popular uh, textile loom uh, for, you know, making cloth as well. It was very popular uh, from the 1700s up to the 20th century. And it was kind of, it was called the spinning mule because it was kind of like this hybrid type uh, machine that was kind of like a cross between uh, the uh, spinning jenny uh, and, of course, the water frame. And so it got the name spinning mule uh, because of it. But it was very popular, and Sam Crompton's on the bottom left there. He's the guy that kind of designed and built it. So, yeah, that one. And they had one more, uh, of course, I'll talk about that's real famous. Uh, Edmund Cartwright on the bottom right there, he invented in 1785 the so-called power loom. Power loom is really considered to be the most efficient uh, like textile loom uh, ever made to create cloth. Uh, it's still used today. Like countries throughout the world still still use it to make cloth overall. So it's the most advanced kind. I guess produce the most cloth overall to make clothes. And um, I think at first it was steam power, and then later models, were, of course, were powered by electricity today, uh, as you know. That's the one that everybody thinks about when they think about you know these these textile looms to make cloth. Uh, of course, they always talk about co the cotton gin, which the video talked about uh, at the beginning. Uh, yeah, Eli Whitney, who was an American, invented the famous cotton gin uh, in 1793. 
Uh, as you know, it helped revolutionize uh, the development of the cotton industry uh, because before that, it was very difficult to remove you know, the cotton seed from the cotton bowl. Uh, in fact, it was almost going to put the cotton industry out of business until he invented this machine. Uh, and Eli Whitney was actually this uh, inventor that was more known for developing, um, I think, interchangeable parts for like guns and muskets and things like that. Uh, but I think he, he he made the cotton gin, but I don't think he made much money off of it. But it later led to uh, the cotton boom, which you know cotton became real popular uh, in the 19th century, especially in the American South, where they talk about cotton cotton is king and all that. But it led to increased amounts of slavery. Uh, as well, uh, which, as you know, was a major cause of why the American Civil War happened. So it was kind of indirectly, it kind of helped cause the Civil War uh, later. But his invention is still used today, of course, uh, the cotton gin. Here's, of course, another picture of the cotton gin uh, right there uh, you're looking at. Now, I'm going to talk about some other inventions that came along that were really big, of course, uh, in uh, the Industrial Revolution. Of course, that one on the bottom right you're looking at uh, during, I guess, that period of the first industrial was one, yeah, period of the first industrial revolution, one of the biggest inventions that was ever developed uh, around the late 18th century, which is the so called steam engine, which James Watt uh, helped to invent. Uh, and um, the steam engine had been around for a while. It went back to like the early 1700s uh, because uh, early steam engines, by the way, were first used uh, for, for uh, removing water from uh, coal mines, where they would convert water to steam and bring it up. And, uh, and um, Watt uh, had discovered this uh, machine called the Newcomen engine, uh, which had been designed in 1712 by this man named Thomas Newcomen, who was an English uh, engineer, and it was impractical. It didn't work very well, and it broke down. And so uh, in the 1770s, he designed and built uh, this new engine called the Watt, it's what we call the Watt steam engine or Watt engine, it's what it's usually called. And it helped revolutionize pretty much the whole industrial revolution. It was very practical and worked very well. And over time, it would be used in other industries. And so that's that's why it was became very important, this invention, probably the greatest invention ever made, I think, at that point so far. Uh, in the Industrial Revolution. Uh, he was Scottish, too, by the way. Uh, and um, was not just an engineer, but an inventor and uh, an entrepreneur that uh, made a lot of money uh, selling these machines. I think he was one of the first millionaires to make a lot of money uh, off, of his, off of his inventions uh, and so on. Here's a picture, of course, of the Watt engine uh, right there as an example a lot of the early Watt engines were, by the way, very slow, like just a few horsepower. Uh, but later ones will be like, you know, several thousand horsepower and things like that. And the term horsepower was something that he invented, by the way, Watt, uh, which kind of came out of the idea that it's equal to so many horses. Uh, of course, the electrical Watt was later named for him uh, as well. Uh, then you had Robert Fulton uh, also as well. Uh, Fulton was, of course... Uh, an American inventor uh, who uh, developed a lot of these uh, early steamboats that would be up and down the rivers in the United States, Mississippi, and so on. Uh, and uh, there was a ship he built, which uh, they sometimes call it the uh, Claremont, but the original name uh, that it was called was actually the North River Steamboat. Uh, and it was considered one of the first commercial steamships ever built in the world which was built in 1807, and it was operated on the Hudson River Valley, like where New York is. Uh, and um, they call it the Claremont later as well. I think that's where I thought it was built, I think is what it was, where it got the name. And so uh, at first it used like a paddle wheel, you know, to, to basically using like steam power, uh, basically. And then later they'll have propellers, of course, being used uh, by the... Um, late, late uh, 19th century uh, as well. There's, of course, a replica of, of course, uh, the North River steam steamer or steamship or steamboat uh, or Claremont that you have here. Uh, they think later uh, he was known for building also one of the first 
submarines uh, that was called the Nautilus, uh, which they, they called them in those days submersibles, I think was the nickname they called it. And uh, I think he built these originally to um, try to help Napoleon fight the British Navy and sink their ships. And you'll notice it has a propeller on it, which, you know, a lot of ships later will have propellers. And, and that may have been one of the first uh, actual ships to have a propeller on it uh, right there. Interesting about that. Uh, then you've got the locomotive. Uh, in the 19th century, uh, the, the locomotive or train, you know, becomes the big thing uh, in a lot of industrialized nations uh, overall. And so uh, because of that, in the 1800s or 19th century, they start calling that period uh, the age of the iron horse because most of, you know, locomotives were built out of iron and they're often comparable to the speed of a horse and how fast they are. And so most, the, the mark of industrialized nations was having, you know, a network of railroads that connected different parts of your uh, state or whatever. And uh, Richard Trevithick, who was a British engineer, he's the one that first designed the first actual uh, locomotive, which was very primitive. It was built on iron rails and only went about six miles per hour, uh, to give you an idea. Uh, and I think the first one you see there, that's a replica that you're looking at, uh, it was called Catch Me Who Can. Uh, and I forget the, the amount it pulled, but looks like, yeah, you know, there it is, 25 tons. You could pull 25 tons, which is, you know, pretty amazing uh, for that time. Uh, they had this man named George Stevenson, though, uh, in England. He was really more famous uh, than uh, Trevithick was. Uh, he was considered important because he was one of the first to build, like, an actual railroad. Uh, in, in somewhere in the world. Uh, and he built what they call the Liverpool and Manchester Chester Railway, which was finished in 1830. It was the first railway to connect uh, to two different cities, like Liverpool to Manchester, southern England. And so it, later they gave him a nickname. They called him the father of the railways because he kind of helped to start the whole railway industry uh, in general. And he and his son started building like locomotives uh, also as well. Uh, he had a son um, who also built built railroads and uh, built built locomotives as well. And uh, there was a there was a famous um, locomotive you're looking at right there called the Rocket, uh, which was built around 1829 in that picture. And that was considered one of the first major locomotives ever built. Uh, that was kind of like a prototype to uh, other uh, railroads. I think his name was Robert Stevenson. He was a son of his. Uh, he is famous for some of today that's still around. Uh, of course, a lot of these locomotives look totally different than what they did back in the 19th century. But if you look at this set of rails uh, right here, uh, one thing that Stevenson did do, he created what they call the standard gauge uh, or the so-called Stevenson gauge, uh, which is the main type of rail system that's used today, uh, which is about four feet, eight and a half inches wide. Or, or if you want the millimeters, it's 1,435 millimeters wide. About two thirds or more of most railroads use that type of standard gauge, uh, basically. They have other ones, like if you go here, they've got the narrow gauge, which I think is the other type of rails that they also make too, uh, as well. Uh, but the standard gauge is primarily the one that everybody uses uh, today uh, overall. Now, they started making these rails out of iron, uh, but eventually they start developing uh, steel, which is, you know, stronger iron. Uh, and uh, there was an English uh, manufacturer you may have heard of uh, named Henry Bessemer. You may have heard of Bessemer, Alabama, uh, in the United States as an example. But he used to make a lot of steel. And uh, he was really one of the first to mass produce a lot of cheap steel uh, using a process uh, that was known uh, as the Bessemer process uh, or Bessemer conversion. It's called different names. And what they did with it, he used these large type of furnaces uh, to convert like molten pig iron into steel uh, by using oxidation, using carbon, uh, which the proper term actually to use is carburizing. I get that correct there, injecting carbon into it, but carburizing 
uh, is the correct term. So they put a little carbon into it, and that makes the the iron, the steel, you know, makes it steel, which is more stronger you know, than iron, not as brittle, lasts longer. And things it's not quite like stainless steel, which is better than that. Uh, but that's the, that's basically something that he started doing, uh, and um, that that's something really important uh, because you know uh, the development of the steel is going to change a lot of industries, not just commercial wise, but also in warfare uh, as well. Uh, Andrew Carnegie, by the way, who was a Scottish American, uh, came to the United States and he was heavily influenced by Bessemer uh, as well and would develop a lot of the steel industry in the area of Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, you know, Pennsylvania, and all that. Uh, and he develops later the Carnegie Steel Company, which later evolves into the what they call U.S. Steel, you may have heard of, which was considered one of the first billion-dollar corporations uh, ever developed in the world. The uh, United States is not big in the steel industry like we used to. In fact, China produces 10 more times the amount of steel than we do, just to kind of give you an idea uh, of that. But anyway, uh, talking about the development of iron and steel, that's something big, too. Because without that, you wouldn't have, like, skyscrapers and bridges and other things like that being built, et cetera. And of course, there's a large size Bessemer converter uh, that you look at where they'd have these furnaces where they would uh, basically cook it to like really high temperatures to, of course, uh, create steel out of it. All right, I'm going to get into also uh, other inventions that impacted the modern times, especially most of these are more into like the second industrial revolution, but I'll kind of talk about these a little bit today. Uh, overall, of course, one field which was really big, especially by the mid to late 19th century, was telecommunications. That's something new uh, you start to really see. Uh, the two big things early on were the telegraph, of course, developed first, uh, then the telephone, and then, of course, wireless radio, usually uh, in that order. Uh, the one on the bottom right there in the middle, uh, Samuel Morse uh, was an American uh, who was very influential in developing uh, the telegraph uh, industry uh, in the United States, and he influenced other countries, too, to do the same. Well, that's why he's got all his medals on his chest, of course, from different countries, giving him his, giving him medals for his, his invention. Uh, and uh, he also developed Morse code uh, to send messages, of course, using the telegraph as well. And Morse was uh, the first to send a telegraph message, which in 1844 was the famous message, which was, what hath God wrought, uh, of course. Uh, later, uh, Western Union, by the way, would monopolize, you know, the telegraph industry. In fact, we were talking about U.S. Steel and all that, but Western Union was actually considered the first corporation. I don't know if you know that or not. They would monopolize the telegraph industry, but now they're known for more like sending messages or money and stuff like that now. Uh, but originally, they they dominated the telegraph industry uh, overall. Uh, the man on the bottom left uh, is um, uh, Guglielmo Marconi. He was actually Italian that came to the United States uh, in the late late 19th century, uh, and um, he was important in pioneering wireless telegraph because uh, he had his own company. Eventually, he started developing, which was called the so-called. Um, Marconi Wireless Telegraph Company, uh, and so they figured out that you could send, you know, messages via radio, radio waves, uh, pretty much. And so if you sent messages through his telegraph company, it was called a um, Marconi Gram. That's basically what it is. So you got things like that coming along, and radio will become popular, like for music, news, and things like that today, like we have already right now. Uh, sometimes I talk about Nikola Tesla. He was kind of instrumental, too, uh, in a lot of inventions, especially in the Industrial Revolution, the second one anyway. And um, he was actually from um, what is Serbia. He's Serbian-American, you know, about this. And he was instrumental in developing a lot of uh, inventions, like in the electrical field and mechanical engineering field uh, overall. And, of course, the most famous thing he was instrumental in developing uh, was to deal with electricity. Uh, and 
He was one of the first to suggest that the best form of electricity, at least the transform transfer of it to different parts of you know the country or whatever, uh, would be using what they call alternating current, uh, which I think Thomas Edison at the time was trying to push the idea of direct current, which was more dangerous. Uh, and so if you know about the 19th century, they had this thing called the current wars where they couldn't decide which type of electro electrical supply uh, to use. And eventually they chose AC over DC, uh, if you know that. Uh, I think the only way they use DC today is if you have to sit in the electric chair. <laughs> yeah, you killed somebody. That's a form of direct current, you know, of course. So, which I think that the um, electric chair was invented by uh, Thomas Edison, <laughs> by the way. Um, now, they have also Alexander Graham Bell, uh, of course. You may have heard, everybody's heard of him, I think, pretty much. Uh, Bell, who was actually Canadian, who came to America. And in Philadelphia, he invented the uh, telephone in 1876. Uh, and, of course, it later led to his famous company being developed, which was the Bell Telephone Company. That's an important company because for a bunch of years, the United States, uh, it practically monopolized the whole phone industry. Uh, I think until the 20th century when they broke it up uh, and all of that. And so telephone was something that was considered to be an invention that was pretty important uh, overall because just about everybody's got a telephone now, like cell phones, uh, pretty much uh, today. Uh, originally, it was actually developed by Bell uh, because he wanted to help out uh, deaf deaf children, like in like school or whatever. That's actually what it was designed. Uh, it helped deaf kids be able to hear. Uh, and uh, eventually he realized they could use it for telecommunications and things like that. And so by the turn of the 19th into the 20th century, that became a big invention. Uh, then I sometimes usually talk about the Wright brothers. I think everybody's heard of them pretty much. Uh, Orville, Wilbur Wright, uh, who were from Ohio. Uh, they were actually bicycle mechanics uh, that uh, developed uh, the first airplane, uh, which, by the way, they, they flew the first airplane uh, in 1903 at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. Uh, and uh, believe it or not, the, the, the Wright brothers, uh, Orville and Wilbur, uh, they heard about gliders, about how gliders were starting to be developed at the time. And so they started building some of the first gliders about the, at the turn of the 20th century. And they realized they could put like a propeller on it, basically an engine. Uh, and so uh, they built this airplane, which you can see here, uh, which was called the Wright Flyer. It's called usually. And uh, I think Oroville was the one that flew the first plane on December 17th, 1903. Uh, and uh, the airplane's important because it'll help to revolutionize not only, you know, com commercial aviation, but warfare, like air combat and things like that. You'll see it in using warfare, uh, bombing cities and things like that. It's bad stuff, I guess, later. Of course, they have. But um, it's something that they helped to invent, of course, because before that, man couldn't fly, and they only thought birds could fly uh, and stuff like that. And so Wright brothers, of course, proved them wrong. A lot of people thought they were crazy, by the way, when they were trying to build these airplanes. Now, um, also, I usually talk about Henry Ford, which they did talk about in a little short video uh, as well. Yeah, uh, the automobile was not invented in the United States. If you know about the Germans, of course, in Germany, uh, developed the first uh, automobile, which Mercedes-Benz, of course, they're the one that developed the automobile uh, in the 1800s. Uh, however, the first like mass-produced automobiles where they started using assembly lines, and that really starts in the United States uh, more than anything. And uh, they always talk about the Model T being one of the first mass-produced automobile uh, in the world. Uh, believe it or not, between 1909 uh, to 1927, 27 million uh, Ford motor, Model Ts were built. That's, a, that's more than a million a year, which part of that was sped up by the assembly line, which they started using uh, in uh, his factories in Detroit, Michigan. And they call it the 10 Lizzie, by the way, because it was like almost like a 10 can on wheels. It was cheaply built. And I think early models uh, could be bought for under $1,000 at the time. Well, it seems like pretty cheap today 
she kind of is. Uh, but back then, that was pretty expensive to buy a car. Anyway, but um, there was a joke about the cars. If you know about the, the so-called Model T, uh, the joke was at first, when it first came out, you can get it in any color as long as black. Because <laughs> they would just paint cars, I think, originally, so they would rust. But later ones will get, have different colors to them. That's the 1927 Model T uh, that you're looking at uh, right there. Um, he, he's one of the first major companies, by the way, to use assembly lines. I think he said 1913 when they started first using it uh, to get, build automobiles. And uh, by the 1920s, his workers were getting paid $5 a day, uh, which was unheard of back then uh, in the early 20th century. So this is like during the roaring 20s, I guess, when good times were kind of going on, uh, of course, economically uh, in the United States. So my, the automobile's definitely an invention that helped to revolutionize uh, pretty much um, transportation. Uh, if you have roads, you can go pretty much anywhere. Uh, of course, they always talk about Thomas Edison when, when we discuss usually the second Industrial Revolution, because the fact that he invented so many things that made people's lives so much easier uh, overall. And um, he had this workshop that he invented, that he developed in uh, what is New Jersey. He used to call it Menlo Park, you may have heard of. And uh, it was like an inventor's workshop, and everybody thought it was like magic, all these new inventions that were coming out uh, that he had uh, in People didn't realize that a lot of his inventions were really hard work uh, in general uh, and um, so like, very demanding work. I mean, like, I think he used to say that I didn't invent this invention. I, I invented ways not to invent it because uh, there was a lot of ways that, of course, it, it failed uh, in the end. Uh, and, um, yeah, these are uh, the, the, the incandescent, incandescent light bulb, which you see uh, on the right is really his greatest invention uh, that he ever really made. Uh, probably out of all the different inventions that uh, had, they already had lights at the time, uh, like arc lights and things like that, but uh, they were, I think they were more dangerous and incand incandescent light bulb was more practical uh, to use like in your home or whatever. It was also one of the first to have electric light power where they lit up like the city of New York City as an example. Uh, the phonograph was another invention that was big uh, he liked, I think it was his favorite invention, uh, the phonograph. Movie projector was another invention, uh, which helped spawn Hollywood, of course, in California. Microphone, kinetoscope, uh, those are other inventions you see uh, that he had. Uh, here's a list of inventions. Uh, besides the kinetoscope, he developed what they call the mimeograph, which was like an early version of like a copy machine, uh, basically. Electric vote recorder, like when uh, representatives in like a, like an assembly would vote. Uh, he came up with this electric boat recorder they could do uh, as well. Microphone, yeah, the microphone is something that people don't realize, but he invented it. Uh, people today, like I'm using a microphone right now, of course. Uh, automatic telegraph machine, of course, is something he developed as well. Alkaline battery, like various the batteries that are used today, like in cars, whatever. Uh, he helped to develop, uh, believe it or not. And he is one of the founding members of what they call General Electric, which, of course, pretty much a conglomerate corporation today uh, that you've heard of. I think it was originally called the Thomas Edison Electric Company or something like that. Uh, before it was called GE uh, and all that. Uh, he was famous for, uh, like, newspaper uh, journals would come to him, and they would ask him to say certain things about his inventions and things like that. And here's one he would say. He would say something like, I never view mistakes as failures. They are simply opportunities to find out what doesn't work. Uh, so that's kind of how he, how he viewed uh, a lot of his inventions. Uh, he said once that I didn't invent the battery. I invented ways not to invent the battery. Uh, or I guess the one I always liked is the one where he said, my inventions are 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration. Uh, so those are kind of inventions that, Edison, probably the most prolific inventor, you know, if you think about it, uh, in the late 19th, uh, early 20th centuries. So they have all these inventions kind of going on, but really inventions, you know, uh, weren't all these advancements were not keeping up uh, for 
for like the average worker. The average worker was not making uh, enough money. Like the industrialists were making a lot of money, like all these different people uh, out there, like John D. Rockefeller developed like the oil industry where I was making a fortune. But the average worker took a while for them to actually make good profits uh, by probably like the 20th century uh, more than more than anything. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, uh, which is an interesting topic, which is the ri the rise of socialism is one thing that really happens, uh, of course, in in Europe and other parts of the world that really takes off where workers uh, want improvements, uh, you know, because they're 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 part of the industrial revolution too, not just all these inventions and technologies and uh, you know assembly assembly lines and things like that. You start to see economic booms uh, throughout throughout the world, uh, but they're not just they're not profiting from it uh, in in general uh, and all that. And uh, at the time, you know, if you look at workers uh, in in general, um, the average the average worker. Uh, didn't make much. I mean, the wages weren't keeping up with all these new changes that were going on. Uh, the working conditions were very poor. Uh, people were living in crowded housing on uh, things like that. Uh, there was no workers' comp and things like that that they had. The average skilled worker, by the way, made somewhere between $1 to $3 a day. So we were talking about... Um, you know, board, you know, paying his workers five dollars a day, that's pretty darn good money uh for the early nineteen hundreds at the time. Doesn't seem like it, you know, that kind of thing. But you can see that they didn't have things like health insurance, uh, no workers' compensation, uh, no kind of benefits, uh, very few unions. I think in the nineteenth century you start seeing unions on uh, things like that, but that's kind of limited, you know, uh, at the time. Now, I'm going to get into socialism today, but socialists wanted to advocate for the complete control of the economy, where uh, basically some kind of centralized government does planning uh, with the economy uh, to control it and maintain it. Uh, or or the people, of course, was, I think, one, one other reason, of course, or way uh, that socialism worked, because there's different forms of socialism, of course, uh, that exist. Uh, one of the first you see there uh, is what they call utopian socialism, uh, which became very popular, by the way, uh, in the 19th century. And uh, this type of socialism started in countries like France uh, and England, uh, and it even went to uh, the United States. Uh, and um, it was a type of uh, socialism where uh, it involved a lot of... Um, local communes, like farming type communes. And so people, I think, called it sometimes uh, cooperative socialism. And so that was like an early form of socialism that was kind of popular. They believe socialism was something that evolved uh, out of the French Revolution, believe it or not, uh, back in the late 18th century. And by the 19th century, because of the Industrial Revolution, uh, it became a popular idea. Uh, those are examples of early socialists that were kind of famous, especially ones that were so-called utopian socialists, like Robert Owen, I think was one of them, uh, Charles Fourier, and Count St. Simon. Uh, the first one's an English guy. And Fourier and St. Simon, uh, of course, were French uh, as early uh, socialists. Uh, a lot of these utopian socialists uh, formed these like places like, uh, like in the United States, they had a bunch that were kind of well known, like New Harmony, uh, Brook Farm, uh, Oneida Society. You may have heard of that, which is in New York, up, upstate New York at one point. Even like the Amish, think of the Amish and the Mennonites living in these farm communes. It's kind of similar to this idea of utopian socialism, form of early communism, maybe uh, if you want, uh, also uh, as well. In fact, here's one right here uh, New Harmony, which uh, Robert Owen kind of experimented with uh, in, in the 19th century it was an uh, industrial commune where workers would all live uh, in a town. You see this a lot later into the 19th, 20th century, the United States, uh, they have these steel towns and coal towns and things like that, that kind of developed that kind of idea uh, or that. Uh, but a lot of the uh, socialists like Karl Marx thought these uh, like utopian socialists were kind of like dreamers. 
uh, pretty much. Uh, and Marx is really the most influential figure, really, uh, when it comes to socialism. I'm going to kind of show you a short video uh, on Karl Marx today, but kind of goes more into his to the background. Marx, Marx, of course, was a famous uh, German philosopher uh, and also an economist. So let me show you a little short video, of course, about him. A well, short sure, video, of course, what Karl Marx, uh, the father of Marxism, and all that. So, yeah, Marx was heavily influential. Uh, his Communist Manifesto, like I said, came out in 1848, uh, of course. And um, really, his brand of uh, Marxism was more like a scientific version of, of socialism. Uh, and um, he was, of course, he and uh, Frederick Engels helped to developed the Communist Manifesto uh, overall. Marx, Marx had different theories, though, about, uh, you know, what would happen to capitalism. Because, you know, uh, Marxism became like a rival type system to uh, the capitalist system, which some people thought was more popular uh, than the other. And uh, he really believed that um, what happened over time was that the capitalist system would decline uh, and may, may even collapse uh, eventually. And uh, the Marxists really believe that there's this internal class struggle that's going on uh, in the capitalist society uh, between different social classes. Uh, utopian socialists didn't believe that, by the way. They thought that everybody was equal within their commune uh, or whatever. And uh, he, uh, Marx believed that um, over time, because of like a wealth gap between you know the upper classes and the lower classes, like the working classes on the bottom, uh, that these inequities, the pay gaps and things like that, uh, would eventually lead uh, to like a workers' revolution, was what he called it. And that would lead to socialism. And then they think socialism would lead to eventually communism, which communism is a type of, you know, type of uh, economic system where uh, basically you'd have a class of stateless society and there would be no money, by the way. Uh, and of course, Marx talks about the two different sides. You got the capitalists; uh, these are those are the so-called bourgeoisie uh, that control all the factories. They're the ones that invest uh, in all the markets, uh, in all the industries, and hold the capital and all the most of the money. Uh, a lot of them rose up through the upper middle class because uh, the nobility became more powerless, of course, because uh, of the decline of absolutism and things like that, and the feudalism ended too, uh, as well. And the workers, the workers, of course, are called the proletariat. Those are the ones that work for wages, uh, and the capitalists make as much money as possible by paying them less, uh, of course, overall. Uh, as you know, uh, capitalism developed, uh, uh, social, so socialism itself, like the first socialist country to really develop a challenge, you know, capitalism uh, more than any anything was in Russia. Russia, of course, as you know, in the 1920s, developed the Soviet Union, uh, or USSR, or CCCP, uh, which was around for about seven decades, up to like the like 1990s. And a lot of the um, type of socialism it was based on was kind of a mix of Karl Marx's theories and also Vladimir Lenin, uh, who was a famous uh, socialist and communist in Russia. And um, this type of uh, communism uh, was a type of system where basically the whole country uh, is socialist. So there's no capitalism pretty much in it, uh, usually. And uh, the idea was to have a one-party state. So there's no there's no other political parties. Uh, you're, you're either in the Communist Party uh, or you're, you're either with us, with us or you're without us, you're not against us, I guess. Uh, so uh, they would create these socialist republics everywhere uh, that they would have. And uh, their, their brand of um, communism was kind of evolved into more of a totalitarian version, which Joseph Stalin kind of helped to develop. I think he called it communism in one country. That's what he dubbed it uh, more than anything. Uh, they did have what they called Maoism, which was kind of similar uh, to uh, what Marxist Leninism was. It's kind of like the same thing, uh, pretty much, except it was kind of developed in the People's Republic of China by the 1940s and 50s. And it was kind of like similar to the brand that was developed in the Soviet Union, but it used more of the peasants, like more of a peasant form of 
communism that was real popular. And that idea spread also into like South, South, South uh, East Asia uh, as well, and also into uh, North Korea. Uh, of course, the People's Republic of China is becoming more capitalist today. So yeah, their government might be, you know, like I said, communist or whatever, but pretty much the people in China, the Chinese people have really become more capitalist. So it's interesting to see what's going to happen eventually with China, you know, with their uh, economy and government, uh, if it will evolve eventually into like social democracy, or is it going to be like more of a capitalist state, uh, and maybe even more democratic later down the line. Uh, over over time, you know, they uh, be study about, you know, what happens with, with socialism uh, in general. You'll have eventually a uh, social democracy. That's the thing that really replaces uh, more or less the communist version, uh, which is not not as popular, which is more totalitarian. Uh, social democracy is more of a capitalist type state uh, that uses some socialist ideas. Uh, that's really becoming more popular. Uh, social democracy tends to embrace the use of democracy uh, in an economic political type system where they want to have fair markets, you know, for all people. Uh, so uh, you've got a deal uh, where it is like, you know, pretty much like a capitalist system uh, with some socialist ideas, of course, uh, in it uh, as well. So social democracy is very popular, of course, throughout Europe. Uh, you even have the so-called Nordic model, uh, which is also similar to it uh, as well. Uh, of course, in nations like the United States, you know, you have what they call sometimes welfare capitalism. That's kind of what we have also, just kind of similar uh, to capitalism in, in the United States. We're more of a capitalist, of course, economy here in the United States, but we do have a lot of social welfare type programs uh, as well, uh, which uh, are also offered as well. So things like, you know, health care, uh, benefits, uh, pensions, you know, social care, those are things that are offered by, you know, companies and corporations and things like that today. But you do got, you know, like things like, you know, Obamacare, you know, Medicare, Social Security, socialist kind of ideas uh, that kind of are part, of course, uh, of, of really our economy and all that. So socialism, yeah, it's, it's here, probably here to stay, uh, you know, uh, throughout the world. Uh, it's that a lot of people, when they think of socialism, they think of, like communism, which uh, communism or totalitarian, you know, version of socialism has killed a lot of people. And I think I want to say, I know in the 20th century, they say it killed like 100 million people uh, throughout the world uh, because a lot of people didn't really want to do what they wanted to do, you know. And so a lot of people left those countries or they were sent into exile or even killed, uh, that kind of thing. So anyway, um, now, um, Later, of course, I'll have future lectures coming up, uh, which I'm going to be moving on to talk about really uh, the World War I era. We'll kind of talk about that and uh, the Russian Revolution. Those will be other topics I'll get into uh, as well. And I'll kind of talk about some of the causes of World War I, which a lot of these go back to the 19th century, which uh, probably one of the biggest causes I'll kind of talk about will be the rise of nationalism. That's really the, the main thing that really caused World War I. I'll probably talk about other things like the rise of uh, imperialism, which was big uh, in the 1800s uh, as well, because that's considered another cause uh, of it. But So I'll be kind of moving on to that and then eventually, of course, talk about the 20th century more or less uh, than anything. Now, before I go, uh, I did want to talk about a few things about assignments uh, that are out there. Uh, don't forget, uh, I think I think the assignments I told you that are out there. First exam, uh, of course, uh, is due uh, on on um, Friday. I couldn't figure which what it was about. I don't know why, but age of absolutism is the topics, you know, uh, lecture wise uh, on those. Uh, so try to get that. That's got to get wrapped up this week because I'm going to be giving you your second exam probably on Friday. Like I'll probably post it, which will be due later. But I'll be posting that soon, of course, uh, for the end of the month to to, to finish. Uh, and then um, first exam bonus quiz, which is on the, uh, I think I told you, the scientific revolution and age of enlightenment. Uh, that's just for extra credit. So that's optional for you to do that one. Uh, but you want 20, uh, 30 bonus points, I think it is. Uh, that's something you need, definitely need to do. 
British Empire quiz uh, will be due sometime next week uh, as well. Uh, that's been posted in quizzes. And the second vocab coming up is due uh, as well, uh, starting this Friday. But I told you you get a week to turn that in until next Friday, uh, I think on the 25th. Uh, by the way, um, I think earlier had some students that had been watching. I'm sorry I get you all late, but yeah, hey, what's up, Trey? You're doing great today. Diamond, what's going on? And hey, hey, what's up, Abigail? Hope you all are having a great week out there uh, overall. Uh, I'll see you all, of course, uh, next week. Uh, I think my live lectures for next week uh, will likely be uh, predominantly on the rise of, um, I think, I think the rise of fascism in World War II. Uh, main live ones. Uh, recorded lectures will mostly be, of course, on World War I. Uh, that's coming up probably Friday. So that's it for today. Uh, if you have any comments, of course, questions about this uh, you know, live stream or lecture, uh, please let me know later on the channel. You can also subscribe to my channel as well if you haven't done that as well. So y'all have a great you know, weekend uh, coming up. Uh, and I'll see y'all, of course, next next week with some of my live, live lectures. So Y'all, y'all take care. Oh, by the way, no masks anymore. Be going campus at BRCC. Yeah, isn't that great? So y'all take care. Have a great weekend, like I said, coming up.